So what do you know? What do you know? Uh, that's a, kind of a good question this morning. That's uh, something we sometimes, when we're greeting somebody or see somebody we haven't seen in a while, we might say, hey, what do you know? Uh, do y'all do that or is it just a Johnson County thing? Y'all do that too, right? Okay, got a few people do that. All right. And so it's kind of a thing that we ask people. Uh, now, if you were to ask that question to the Apostle Paul, his answer would be simple, wouldn't it? He would say to you, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And so, uh, only Jesus and Him crucified. And before we go on, I want to give you kind of the breakdown, the outline, uh, as I understand it, of the passage uh, today in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that was just read to us. And that is this, uh, verses, first of all, uh, in these verses he gives two main thoughts that he's really talking about. And uh, in verses 1 through 5 he talks about the simplicity of the gospel. The simplicity of the gospel. Determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and crucified. But then in verses 6 through 16 he talks about the complexity of the gospel. And so that is kind of where he is today to say that uh, it's very simple, but yet if it's so simple, why are there so many people in the world who just don't get it? You would think it would be something, you know, the Bible in the Old Testament talks about that, uh, that God's uh, plan, even a, a wayward fool could understand. But why is it that so many people just don't get the message? And, uh, you know, I believe, of course, that as Paul brings out, that there's uh, some problems there because there's, there's some mystery involved when it comes to God. And people get kind of uh, stumbled full of things. You know, sometimes if you're, uh, you ever taken a test and the answer seems obvious, but... Uh, you, you feel like, well, that's just too obvious, and you, you want to come up with something else. And sometimes the obvious answer is the right answer. And sometimes your first uh, thought is the right answer. But we, we want to make things harder than they are sometimes. And so, you know, sometimes I'm asked when I enter a room to visit a patient in the hospital, uh, one of the things I get asked sometimes is, what denomination are you? What church do you belong to? And I really, I don't care for that question, to be honest with you. Now, if they press me enough, you know, I will tell them, uh, you know, I usually start out by saying, well, I, I, I'm, I'm a chaplain and I, I represent Jesus. And for some people that satisfies them. But for other people, uh, they, they really want to know what, what denomination. And so I will tell them. I say, well, uh, I, if you really must know, I, I'm a Methodist. But Jesus got a hold of me before the Methodists did. So that, that usually satisfies most people. Uh, but uh, I was in a room the other day visiting and praying with actually uh, Dave. Uh, King David is here with us today. and He's been in the hospital. Uh, we want to continue to pray for him. We've been praying for him. Uh, had some uh, tests done with his heart. and He's with us today doing good. Uh, but a patient was, you know, was talking to him beside him and said... Uh, I said, uh, just told him I was a chaplain. He said, uh, he said, do you believe Jesus died for you? And I said, I sure do. And he said, then you're my brother. Fist bump. <laughs> and uh, so I like that. That's, that's, that's good. And we'll call this fellow Bob. By the way, I, may say, I may say more about Bob in a minute. If I forget, you remind me. But, uh, but Bob's an interesting fellow. But wisdom is a word that comes back again and again to Paul. Uh, what do you know? And, 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 and you know, what, is, what is the revelation? What is the wisdom? And so, what is it, Paul, that you can pass on to us? What is the body of knowledge? As Paul comes rolling into town, uh, what is the body of knowledge you can give to us? What is the wisdom? What is the word for today? And Paul said, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Not because he didn't have knowledge or wisdom. He had plenty of it. I mean, he was a Pharisee, so he could talk your ear off of things he knew. He knew stuff. It wasn't because he was ignorant. 
it was because this was the most important thing to him. And so uh, it wasn't that he didn't have information to give, but the information that he wanted was a priority that he really wanted to pass on. And sometimes people get caught up in all the little things. Sometimes when you're talking to somebody about the Lord and you really want to impress on them the importance of, of knowing God, they want to ask you all kinds of questions to get you on these rabbit trails and to get you off the subject. And you'll, you'll, they'll come up with, you know, talking about uh, Revelation and all that, the book of Revelation, and anything to, to change the subject. But Paul would not allow that to happen. Every time they tried to get him off the subject, he came back to the main subject, and that is Jesus. That is Jesus. There's a song by Casting Crowns. It says, only Jesus. Only Jesus. And that's what I believe that Paul would say today. And so, I guess you could say our content then is about Jesus, right? It's about giving people information about Jesus. Well, Paul would say, no, not really. That's not what it's about. Uh, the information alone is not enough. You see, I think we do people a, dis a disservice when we just give them information. And we could stand up here and give you all kinds of information today, but that's not what Paul really thought was important, just information. You know, uh, we, we understand that there's a whole lot of things that can be said, and we do teach, and we do give information and all that, but there's more to it than that. Uh, Paul says he came... Uh, uh, with fear and trembling. And so for Paul, it was more than just information. It was a relationship, a relationship with God and a relationship with one another. When it all really comes down to that. It's about a relationship. And, you know, we can have information, and it may be the wrong information, but if you know Jesus, you've got the right information to get you to heaven. That's all you really have to know. But look at verse uh, 3 there. He says, I, I came to you. With, not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but with what? Fear and what? Trembling. I came with fear and trembling, and he came in weakness. The Apostle Paul, this great man of faith, this great man of God who wrote so much of the New Testament, admits that he came and he was scared and he was in weakness and fear and anxiety when he came to this church. Now, some of that was probably because of the people in the Corinthian church. There was a, a difficult bunch. I've had a few churches like that, and, uh, you know, it's been, it, it can be tough. Part of it also is because uh, he had just had a bad experience at Athens, and uh, he came from that experience and was walking into another situation and didn't know exactly maybe what he was getting into. But the point that he was making is, I came with fear and trembling. It wasn't the man that was important. It wasn't that he was a powerful man that was important. It was what he brought to the people that was important. We get caught up in all these personalities and, and who we like and all that, like, like the Corinthians did. But Paul wanted to make sure that they understood that what he was delivering didn't come by enticing words, although he could have words of wisdom. He could. But he didn't want to make the gospel about that. All he had to offer was himself and Jesus Christ who lived within him. Now think about this for a moment. The United Methodist Church kind of has a, uh, a mission statement. And that mission statement is making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Now that's hard enough to understand and to put it uh, into practice. Uh, but, you know, when you think about the fact that we're wanting to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, Paul says, you know, it, it's a very simple thing. He was among the people, not with plausible words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit and of power. The demonstration of the Spirit was of power. What does that mean? What did he mean when he said, I didn't come with you with all these enticing words? But I came with you with a demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, you know, if you were to ask certain people that question, you might get different answers depending on the denomination. You see, I grew up in a background where if the preacher could, could snort 
and spit over the first five, five pews and jump a couple pews and run around the building a few times. It didn't matter so much what you said, but that was preaching, brother. You know, you were really in the spirit if you were able to do that stuff. And so I wouldn't be in the spirit according to many of those preachers. I mean, I remember one old preacher, buddy, he was... Uh, he was, uh, he, he had this big old Bible, it looked like a family Bible. He carried it around with him, and he would preach, and if you sat on the first row, he, he would pick that Bible up and hit you in the head with it. I guess you could call him a Bible thumper, right? <laughs> Sorry about that. But anyway, he was, that's just the way he was. Or some of them would work, would walk around and shake everybody's hands, and you'd probably about 20 times you'd get your, they'd shake your hands. And that was preaching. Well, that's okay. That's that may be the tradition. And, and, you know, the point that Paul is making here is not, preaching is not about how high you jump or how loud you scream. That is not what the demonstration of the Spirit is about. That's not really what it's talking about. The point is that when the Spirit of God is involved in the message, and the message is not about the preacher, but it's about God bringing that message into your heart and your life. If Today, this sermon connects with somebody. If the Holy Spirit takes this sermon and it connects with the heart of a child of God today, then the Spirit has done its job, its job. You know, there's a world out there searching for answers. So what do we have to give the world? What do we have to offer them? No gimmicks, nothing spectacular, no fog machines or light shows. What do we have, really? To offer somebody that walks in those doors there, all we have is Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And I'm going to tell you, if that's not enough for you, if the man that hung on the cross between heaven and earth is not enough for you, then I'm afraid I don't have anything else to offer you today. I'm afraid I don't have anything else to give you today because only Jesus died for my sin. One time, a fellow was, a, a priest was talking to a fellow, and he, uh, he said to him, he was, this man was, was dying, and, and, and this certain priest said, well, fellow, he said, would you like for me to absolve you from all your sins? And that fellow said, well, let me see your hand. He said, what? He said, let me see your hand. And he looked at his hands, and he said, I don't see any nail prints in those hands think I'll just talk to Jesus. And what I'm saying today is I can't save you. I can't do anything for you. I can't make you holy today. But I know a man who can. I know somebody who's able to do all those things. And so that's what we have to offer today, this world who needs Jesus. Remember Bob? I talked about Bob a little bit ago. Y'all thought I forgot, didn't you? Uh, Bob was in the hospital, and he shared a pretty remarkable story with me. And he said it was all right if I'd share this story. It, it's basically a, a long time ago in his life, he found out he had, had cancer. And uh, at the same time, his best friend uh, was killed. And so he said that he'd come to the end of his rope. He, he was, uh, had some military experience and, would, and just decided, uh, you know, He's he just going to end everything. His wife was a Christian, but he was not. And he said he went out and he got a, a big bottle of pills and some beer and went home and he picked up his pistol and he put all that down on the coffee table and right on the coffee table beside of the Bible that his wife had placed, the family Bible, he placed his pistol down and was getting ready to get wasted. When, he said he was just sitting there when all of a sudden... The Bible just fell off the table for no apparent reason. He didn't hit the table, it just fell off. And he reached down and he picked up that Bible and began to read. And he gave his life to the Lord and he's never been the same since. All because of a Bible and because of a godly woman who didn't scream and point her finger at him, but just simply uh, he was able to see Jesus through her. Uh, the song that Casting Crown says, I don't want to leave a legacy. I don't care if they remember me, only Jesus. And I, I've only got one life to live. I'll let every moment point to him, only Jesus. 
In verse 14, if you have your Bibles, you can see that Paul talks about those that are unspiritual. Look at that with me if you would. Those that are spiritual and unspiritual. He said, the natural man or the natural person receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So Paul is saying there that there are those who cannot understand the preaching of the gospel because it's foolish and because they just don't get it. And because that these things have to be revealed through the Holy Spirit. There is a mystery about God that doesn't make a lot of sense to the world. There is a mystery about God that it, you know, none of us understand completely. But when it comes to the old rugged cross, there are those today that says that just doesn't make sense. I, I, I can't accept the fact that a king would bleed and die as a martyr and as a convicted criminal, and that is what I have to believe in in order to get to heaven. And yet, Paul says there are those who will not get it because they are unspiritual. They are carnal. They do not receive the things of the Spirit of God. They are not receiving the reception on the radio. It's kind of like if you don't pay your XM bill and you don't get XM satellite radio because you're not receiving it, you know. It, FM, if your antenna breaks and you've got AM, FM radio, it's, you're probably not going to get the reception. And if you don't have the Spirit of God that connects you with God, then you're not getting the message that God wants you to hear today. It takes the Spirit of God. And if you can understand only this, that Jesus died for your sins, even that is the Spirit of God. You cannot even understand and accept that, except by the Spirit of God today. So those that do not know God do sometimes don't understand. So does that mean that we're supposed to talk only uh, to insiders, to those of the faith, that we're supposed to only talk to believers and, and, and because no one else can understand anyway? No, that's not what he's saying. But we have to be careful what language we use because, you know, we use all this religious jargon that people don't understand sometimes. When we talk about being born again and justification and sanctifying grace, all these things, uh, some of the church members don't even understand, but let alone the world. And so we have to use language that they understand. And so Paul says, I'm just going to talk about Jesus and him crucified. You should be able to get that if the Spirit of God is working in you and in your life. Once I was talking with a family who had a loved one who was dying in the hospital, and they said, we'd like for you to talk to uh, our loved one, but uh, please understand that he's not a believer. Or he's at least an agnostic. He says he can't, under he can't understand, he don't believe it, but he's dying. He only had a few days to live. And so I went in and visited with this man, and I asked him, I said, do you believe in God? And he said, I don't know. And I said, do you believe Jesus died for your sins? And he says, I don't know. I said, do you have faith in God? He said, I don't know. <laughs> and finally, I said, well, let me ask you this. Do you have just a little bit of faith? Do you believe just a little bit? And he said, yeah, I, I believe a little bit. And I said, well, you know, Jesus said, if you just have a little bit of faith, that's enough. Just a little bit. And I said, if you'd like to be saved today and accept Jesus into your life, you can do that with just the faith that you have. And he did. He come to, come to know the Lord that day. And the next day, God took him out of this world. What I'm saying today is it doesn't take a lot of wisdom and a lot of understanding in order to be saved. Even a child can do it. And so how do you demonstrate God in our preaching? How do we demonstrate God in our preaching today? Paul said, I came with a demonstration. And the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, how do we do that? You know, uh, some people would, as I said, some people would say you got to holler and shout and scream and all that. And that's fine if, if you do that. I've done that a few times myself. But uh, that doesn't mean when I do that I'm always in the Spirit. <laughs> all right? <laughs> Sometimes I holler and scream. I'm not in the Spirit. Trust me. But I want you to know that, that there's more to it than that. So how do we demonstrate the Spirit? We do it, really, 
with our lives. We do it with our lives by portraying Jesus in our lives. Uh, so I've heard people say, well, I don't believe in women preachers. Well, I'm going to tell you something. We're all called to preach. God called each and every one of us to preach. And if we're not preaching, we're not where we need to be because we're called to share this wonderful message of the gospel with everybody out there everywhere. And uh, you may remember this quote, preach the gospel at all times. When necessary, use words. Well, you know, that's been attributed for a long time to St. Francis of Assisi. And you know, the truth is there's not Historians can't find one time that, that he ever said those words, although it does sound like them. But he did say something similar. He said this. Uh, he said, if you go, to, when you go walking to preach, make sure your walking is doing your preaching. So it's pretty much the same thing. So when we're living our lives, we're sharing Christ, we're sharing Jesus. That is the demonstration. And I, as the song says, I've only got one life to live. I don't know. I don't want to leave a legacy. I don't care if they remember me. Only Jesus. And I've only got one life to live. I'll let every second point to him. Only Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you today. And Lord... We understand that unless the Spirit of God touches the heart of a, ch of a ch child of God, Lord, that we can't understand the things of the Spirit of God. But Lord, today we would never even want to know you if you weren't working in our lives. And so I pray, God, today that the message that we want to portray to the world is not our message, whatever that may be. But it is the message that we talked about with our children that Archer even mentioned this morning. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.